Good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alexandra. I'm on the line from Cabot Cheese. I work for Cabot's marketing department in the health and culinary program. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on baking substitution science on behalf of Home Baking Association and the farmers who own Cabot Creamery. Just a couple of things to note before we begin. If you are having trouble seeing the visual part of the presentation, please email healthinfo at cabotcheese.com. That's healthinfo at cabotcheese.com, and our team will do their best to help troubleshoot with you. This webinar is also being recorded and will be available at a later date. We're also planning to provide the PowerPoint presentation itself, which will be available for download in case you'd like to print off any of the recipes or any of the tips shared uh, from our speaker today. And we'll keep you informed on where you can find these in the next couple of weeks. Another thing to note is the questions box on the webinar control panel on the side of your screen. Please type in any questions you may have there, and we'll address them uh, verbally right at the end as we can get to them. We'll also compile a list of questions asked, which will be available uh, along with the recorded webinar and presentation at a later date. For the dietitians on the line, we've applied for continuing professional education credits, and we'll notify you about these uh, upon approval. And for those of you on Twitter, we like to encourage you to tweet about the webinar and any cool facts you learned from our speaker today. So you'll see our Twitter handles there right on the screen, as well as the hashtag BakingFun. And then lastly, uh, in a few days, we'll be sending out a post-webinar email, which will include a survey about the webinar itself. Um, we'd love for you to take a minute to fill this out. And the plus side is that each person who submits a survey will receive a baking resources packet from us and HBA. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with Cabot, we are a dairy farmer-owned cooperative of over 1,200 farm families throughout upstate New York and New England, and we've been in business since about 1919. The best part about Cabot, in my opinion, is that 100% of the profits go right back to our farmers when you purchase any of our products, which includes our award-winning cheddar cheeses, Greek-style yogurt, and butter. So at this time, I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Sharon Davis who is a 30-year uh, veteran family and consumer sciences educator and licensed secondary teacher. We met Sharon through our membership with Home Baking Association, um, which we joined in about 2010. Sharon and executive director of HBA, Charlene Patton, uh, both do wonderful work in growing and supporting the practice of home baking, something that's, of course, near and dear to our hearts as a cooperative of farm families. Sharon graduated from Iowa State University with a Bachelor of Science in Home Economics Vocational Secondary Education. Over two decades, Sharon has continued her education with Kansas State University, the American Institute of Baking, Test Kitchen Bakers, and four professional associations. In addition to authoring and co-authoring many baking educator resources, she has taught more than 500 food, nutrition, and baking seminars at local to international levels for a variety of educators, including those in 4-H and Boys and Girls Clubs, as well as child care providers, school food service, cooperative extension, and family and consumer science educators. Her professional development has continued as a nutritionist, test kitchen director, spokesperson, and consultant to various organizations like the Wheat Foods Council, Hodgson Mill, and finally as program and membership development for home baking associations. Sharon enjoys growing and preparing her own foods with her husband, Greg, and children, Katie and Chris, in Manhattan, Kansas. So now that you know a little bit more about us, we'd like to get to know a little bit more about you. I'd love to administer this poll, and if you could please give us your best answer, that would be great. Okay, and here are the results of the poll, so everybody knows uh, who is joining us today. Okay. 
Thank you very much for participating. So today, our goal is to provide you with a few reliable and affordable nutrient-rich baking substitutions and resources, which you can hopefully extend to the individuals and families you serve, or of course, apply them to your own everyday life. So with that said, I'll now hand the reins over to our speaker today, Sharon. Hello. I want to welcome you all to um, my test kitchen and um, also wish we could see each other face to face. But um, let's just go ahead and um, I look forward to hearing your questions at the end of the presentation as well. So um, we'll look forward to you using that, um, that option. Um, in entering this topic, um, it's, it's important for us to, to realize that there is so much we can do with baking substitution. And today we're going to focus, like the picture shows, on um, work we've done with other food professionals. This is an extension group that um, I worked with recently. Um, but today, with this substitution science goal that we have, we want to look at um, substitutions that can be affordable, can be done at home. Yes, they can always be done um, in a professional kitchen as well. Um, we want to look at the ingredient functions because that predicts how we make the substitutions. Um, you can't, uh, no ingredient is apples to apples. So um, we have to make sure that we understand what the function is that we're altering when we make a substitution. We want to see things be nutrient dense. In other words, we aren't just doing this because um, we don't have anything else to do. We want to be sure that the additions we make have some impact that we're looking for. The methods you use, the temperatures, are really important to success. So I will allude to that. But um, you want to remember that the methods in baking are much more precise than most many, many cooking methods, where you can put a pinch in of this and a pinch of that. In baking, we do need to measure accurately, use the proper tools or scales for that, and then um, be sure that we do methods like preheating properly the oven, um, cooling things properly. And then baking resources and questions will follow, but we will offer throughout this, um, this PowerPoint many, many excellent resources for you. So first of all, let's just make sure that we're on the same page, that we are indeed spending our hour together well. Um, in fact, people bake a lot nowadays, and they do so for the, the age-old reason to treat family and friends with love, to be handcrafted for, from me to you. But as you, as you notice, that gold highlighted one, this has moved up over the years to 60% um, in terms of the reason why people bake. They want to control the ingredients in their food. And they, and they feel either they need to control it or they must control it to improve some outcome in their life. So this Mintel research um, is important to us. You notice if you drop down a couple more, there's saving money. Research sources are important. So sometimes we will bake for ourselves um, because the, the alternative is more expensive when it's not done for us. Uh, when it is done for us. And then the last one I ask you, I beg you as educators to note this. 33% of the people polled in, in the mental survey would beg more if they just knew how. So pass on what you know. Um, the benefits are multiple for baking, and you'll see them just kind of thrown up here. I mean, if you, if you look at even the first one, you can cut calories because not only did you invest calories in preparing the food, but you also um, can control the ingredients. Literacy, science, math, tech, all of those are part of, um, part of the equation. So if you go down the list, they're all goals that we hope to achieve today through what we're talking about. Um, I highlight those arrows, nutrient variety, fruits, veggies, nuts. We want to see those all boosted um, for nu nutrient density. Calcium, potassium, protein can all be benefited. And of course, we can gain the whole grains. Whole grains are indeed the best thing you can do to boost your antioxidants. Fruits, vegetables follow. Portion control is absolutely essential. Please take note of that. Um, that's another thing we can control. So we're going to move into the first ingredient category in baking liquids. And um, I just want to say that we use this first because liquids, the function of liquids is huge. And you first of all see that it moistens and hydrates everything that you put in the, in the bowl, in the mixing bowl. And indeed, you would hear this huge clamor if you could hear the ingredients talk. They would all be um, wanting some of the liquid that you add because they want to be hydrated. They want to be dissolved. They want to have them, their ingredients blended together. They, they then, when the heat hits the combination, it, that liquid will turn to steam and it will expand the air cells. It will gelatinize the, prod, the starches in the product, the proteins in the product. 
and that gives it structure. Um, it will provide flavor, texture, and richness, so that depending on what kind of liquid you use, it can um, add nutrients, and it certainly holds moisture in the product, and it will aid in browning. I use this lovely pumpkin raisin bread as an illustration because hydrating the raisins is important, conditioning them. We'll talk about that twice in this PowerPoint. But um, the liquids are not static in a baked product. They can move in and out and around throughout the product. How you cool the product is important. Cool it on the cooling rack. Take it out of the pan after that minimal um, moment in the pan of cooling um, so that it cools properly and um, the liquids don't um, move in the wrong direction for you to staling. Fruits, veggies um, are a great liquid substitute. Um, we can use, of course, many recipes we use water and milk, and we'll talk briefly about that. But remember that most fruits and veggies are about 80 to 92 percent water. Even if they're hard, like a sweet potato, that sweet potato is still mostly water. So it makes a great addition in many quick breads, from pancakes to waffles to um, loaf breads, anything like this strawberry muffin top. Um, mashed or pureed, the water content of fruits and vegetables will add up to three-fourths of a cup of water to your batter. Um, so just take that into consideration if you decide to substitute, um, take a cup of water. Instead of using a cup of water, you're going to use um, three-fourths of a cup of vegetables, pureed or mashed. Um, then you want to cut that water back appropriately. Your whole grain baking benefits from using these fruits and veggies as an ingredient, especially yeast breads um, will stay moister longer. Um, your whole grain baked goods of any kind that the brand content loves, that extra humectancy of a fruit or vegetable in the bread. So sometimes and often I will just add um, that half a cup of grated carrot or, or mashed pumpkin or mashed sweet potato I have left. I would just put that in, maybe reduce my liquid by one or two tablespoons. And then I know that I have that boost of nutrients as well as moisture and humectancy. Um, if the fruit and veggie is acidic, you want to be sure you reduce the, the baking powder and use a little soda because um, the batter's acidic level will change and it would react better and um, do better if it has the soda and not just the pure baking powder. So a guideline might be then if you're using half to a three-fourths three to a full cup of an acidic fruit, like, um, oh, let's see, rhubarb comes to mind because it's just about ready to be pulled in my garden, then um, you have that rhubarb sauce, you're going to use it in a, in a bread or you're going to use it in something like a, a waffle or a pancake, you want to use a little soda as well. Dairy ingredients are a great um, ingredient for liquid substitution if you've just got pure water in a, in a, in a recipe. Um, for one thing, you want to remember that milk is, of course, mostly water, 90%, but the remainder solids are um, absolutely essential to us. They're proteins and lactose, which increases the sweetness and the browning of the product. You're going to boost the vitamins, vitamins and minerals because they've been added into or um, enriched in the milk. Fortified would be the right word, I think. And then um, it delays staling. Yeast breads, you want to be sure you scald the milk when you're, when you're substituting in more milk. And remember that yeast likes to have at least two ounces of water per package of yeast. One fourth ounce is a package of yeast. And that helps it to function more properly and, and ferment more properly in the, in the dough or batter. So um, scalding, yes, we might say, well, that's old-fashioned. No, it's not to um, take away bacteria. Pasteurization takes care of that just fine. But um, scalding stops enzymatic action, so you will actually see an improvement in the volume of your bread. There is, bakers use a high heat dry milk, and King Arthur flour is one source of that for the home baker. Substitutions. Um, whole milk, just, just, for, just so you know this, um, I have read that many, many uh, people use, only carry skim milk at home because that's what's best for our hearts, and, and that's very true. Um, but if you have a recipe that calls for whole milk and that richness would benefit the product, maybe um, you, you want to make that substitution with two tablespoons of butter for a cup of skim milk. That will equal whole milk. Um, sometimes a recipe will call for heavy cream, and you'll say, well, I don't want it to be skim, but I, but, and this gives you that chance to do the substitution down from heavy cream to um, a lesser amount, but still not lose all of the richness of the butter flavor. Sour milk and buttermilk, both um, that 
that thing my grandma did, one tablespoon lemon juice in the bottom of the cup, the liquid measuring cup, add the milk, whether it's a non-dairy or a dairy milk, it could be almond milk if you have a, um, a case to your lactose intolerance, but um, you add in that lemon, lemon juice or vinegar and stir it up to equal one cup and you will have soured milk within about five to ten minutes. Now we have a new kid on the block that everybody is excited about. It's Creek Style Yogurt, and Cabot um, is helping host this today, and I want to thank them for that. Um, Greek Style Yogurt is unique in that it is um, 90 to 100 percent higher in protein than a, than a regular yogurt. Um, it's been strained, so it has less lactose and frequently has less sodium um, than many of the ingredients we might use in baking. So um, it's a great addition to the options. Between moisture content, you notice it's about 10 to 15 percent less moisture than milk is. So um, you may want to, to then just uh, liquefy it slightly with a little milk. I'll show you it just below here. Um, you will automatically reduce saturated fat and increase protein by substituting yogurt for things like sour cream, cream creme fraiche, and other um, ingredients that are higher in fat. You use it to top waffles, layer parfaits, mix smoothies, and puddings is one of my favorite things of late to do it with, do um, a substitution with. You thin it slightly when you want to sub it for buttermilk. And my primary reason for using yogurt, a Greek yogurt instead of buttermilk, is the wonderful reduction in sodium. And we'll see that later, too. So you use a third of a cup of milk, two thirds of a cup of Greek style yogurt, and you will have a cup of buttermilk. Um, it subs well one for one for sour cream and creme fraiche. Um, and what I wanted to put this dramatic piece of information up there. If you're using a 2% Cabot Greek style yogurt and you go one for one for sour cream, you will automatically take away 40 grams of your fat, 23 grams of saturated fat, and you will boost your protein content by 17 grams. That is exciting. Um, baking functions of fat, um, it's important to remember that fat in baked goods has a wonderful role to play. You might as well maximize the benefits. Um, butter is one of, the, one of the ingredients that does that. It doesn't mean that you have to use 100% butter in everything you bake. Um, but butter brings you um, the, the richness of its flavor. It will tenderize the crumb. And all fats, in fact, do this with the exception of oils, which um, you, have to, you have to trade out some things with oil substitution. You get a flakiness in your biscuits, your pastry, your croissants, your scones. You get crispness in your cookies, crackers, and pie crusts. And it delays the staling, which is, which is a great deal. So remember, your baguette has no fat, and it has to be baked fresh every day. Your, um, your crescent roll that, that you make with a half a cup of butter for six cups of flour, that crescent roll will store longer because of the fat content. Large amounts do interfere with your formation of gluten. So um, you have to keep that in mind. The more fat you put into a yeast dough, the more um, gluten development, structure development you see change. Less can be more. And when you're working with quick breads, especially older recipes um, or, or quick breads that call for as much as a cup of oil, you can easily substitute a variety of um, mashed or grated fruits or vegetables, depending on what your outcome wants to be. One of my favorites is canned pumpkin or mashed sweet potato um, because you get such a big bang for your buck. So if I have a recipe, a quick bread recipe, muffin recipe that calls for maybe two-thirds cup of oil, or, a third, or, or half a cup of um, shortening, I will go ahead and sh cut back that uh, fat to half fat, or at least a third less, and, and substitute that, in, uh, that amount in with the canned pumpkin. Even one tablespoon per serving of pumpkin added gives you a boost of 35% of your daily value, value of vitamin A, and that's fabulous. Another sub you can do for oil in small amounts um, and get a big bang for your buck is flax meal. So let's say sometimes I will just cut back two tablespoons of the oil or the butter or the shortening. And for that, I will put in six tablespoons of flax meal. That will give me the equivalency in oil. But it also gives me, look at the profile there, um, 3,600 milligrams of omega-3, 6 grams of fiber, and 5 grams of protein. And all that for just three tablespoons of flax meal. Greek style yogurt does some cool things. And you look at the chocolate chip cookie over on the right, you'll see that a cup of butter can be substituted with a half a cup of unsalted butter. 
and then a fourth of a cup of your plain Greek style yogurt. And um, in this case, 2% is fine. You could use 10%, but the analysis here was used with 2%. So it's less 52 grams of saturated fat and 727 calories for that substitution. Um, you may get a little more spread in that cookie than you would get with butter because you have a little more moisture. But um, the, the truth is, I think it's well worth gaining these attributes unless you're looking for the standard um, Toll House cookie that you've grown up with. And then um, that the substitutions can make a difference. What I might also do, though, is, OK, I need a little more fat. Maybe I'll put in some flax meal. And so with that substitution you're looking at there under the cookie, you probably could add in three to six tablespoons of flax meal and end up with even a little more crispness because of that oil content in the flax meal. Subbing Cabot light cheddar cheeses can also be a great way to, I mean, if you want to reduce your shortening or oil in a yeast bread and instead um, use a cheese, you'll get the flavors, the nutritive value of that cheese. Protein for fat can also be done in a Greek-style yogurt pie crust, which um, I'm excited about in, in terms of a new opportunity. Um, we've seen lots of tried and true recipes for pie crust, but this one contains the beauty of butter, which gives you that wonderful cold um, uh, solid fat needed to cut in and make the layers with the flour. You don't need as much salt when you're using a salted butter, so you'll notice that's only a fourth of a teaspoon. But then you use that half a cup of Cabot 2% plain Greek style yogurt. And what you do is it, it tenderizes the gluten structure in the product. Both butter and yogurt have a little bit of water in them. They immediately begin to develop gluten if, if, they, if you handle the crust pastry too much. So um, that yogurt helps diminish that gluten development because it's acidic. Some people will use, um, and I've heard everything, um, but vinegar is a common one. My grandmother, you'd see um, her using in a pie crust. And we see vodka used as well. But all of them um, are used to help modify the gluten so that you don't get a tough pie crust. Other substitutions I want you to note, um, in scones, biscuits, shortcakes, anything where you're looking to use heavy cream or sour creams. Again, the heavy cream can be substituted half cream with half Greek style yogurt you might want to use a fourth of a teaspoon of baking soda if no soda is called for, and then knock back your baking powder slightly. Um, cheesecake tiramisu, again, um, we can make that beautiful substitution of half a cup of yogurt for four ounces and plus the four ounces of cream cheese. And that could be a Neuchâtel, a, a light cream cheese um, for the, for the mar mascarpone. You have to forgive me, my, um, my pronunciations are weak sometimes. I'm just too Midwestern. Um, have your cake. Well, the cake itself is not low fat. Most cakes aren't. So prepare your portions accordingly. We do not have to cut the cake in 12 slices. Instead, cut it the way your great-grandmother did when she served tea or book club. I remember it well. They served smaller portions than what we do today. But the frosting on this one is what excites me most. When you look at this, you see the chocolate frosting is a half a cup of plain Greek style yogurt, a half a cup of unsweetened baking cocoa. That would be the not Dutch processed, just the plain baking cocoa. The one teaspoon vanilla extract, one fourth teaspoon cinnamon, and then the, about a pound of confectioner's sugar. So you don't get less sugar. If you look up in the little red box there, you don't get less sugar so much. But you do get um, a cut in calories. And the calories we're cutting come from so little fat. Um, and then the sodium is way down on this, too. You get uh, 95 milligrams less sodium then you get in a canned frosting. So the column on the right would be either a homemade buttercream or a canned buttercream um, frosting. The one on the left pertains strictly to this um, Cabot's chocolate frosting. When we move on into sweeteners and sugars, we realize that um, the diversity is wonderful. We have all these choices. And First and foremost, know where sugar comes from. Um, it is a natural sweetener that we've been eating for 2,000 years. Um, it indeed helped us to determine whether something was poisonous versus um, good for us. So um, sucrose itself, 
table sugar, if you will, brown sugar, confectioner sugar, are derived from plant materials, either either cane sugar, cane beet, cane, excuse me, sugar cane or sugar beets. And um, that plant has stored the carbohydrate that it derived from photosynthesis in either its root or its nectar. Uh, plant parts um, like stevia stores its um, its its sweetener in its plant part as well. So it's a, it's a similar um, concept. Fructose and lactose are, of course, the native natural sweeteners in milk and fructose in fruits and in many things like the corn plant, honey, all have fructose. Baking functions then vary based on whether it's a liquid sweetener or whether it is a granulated sugar. So creaming with granulated sugars is important to aeration in many batters and doughs. And you want to do so adequately, especially with some of the substitutions we have listed coming up. You want to be sure you fully cream um, your batter, your dough, your fat, and your sugar. So if you're not sure about that, you should visit our test kitchens at homebaking.org. You can also see our own video sequences on creaming, um, how, to, how to get enough aeration. Of course, the type of sugar you use will add or vary the flavor, whether you're using an agave nectar, whether you're using honey, whether you're using um, molasses or corn syrup, or what it is that um, sweetens your product. It will help brown the crust. It will help maintain freshness and hold the moisture. And of course, it's food for yeast. Now, to a point, a really, really sweet yeast dough, um, that would be like a cup of sugar with six cups of flour, um, would give you um, actually a, a it would delay the yeast action. It would actually soften the gluten and make um, that product move more slowly. Now, we offer a baking lab manual. You'll see the photo here on the right. And it is a tremendous resource for you to have. Lab 7 is all about what we're talking about right now. Um, but I do want to draw your attention to that lab manual, because every ingredient we're talking about, most of the material we're covering here is covered plus 20 times more in the baking lab manual. The three basic classifications of sweeteners and sugars are they're either caloric, they're artificial, they're natural and caloric, they're artificial, or they are a sugar alcohol polyol, which we don't use those typically in home baking, the last uh, category. In home baking, we tend, we tend and like to use natural sugars and sweeteners. So those would include agave nectar, corn syrup, um, someone like Cairo corn syrup, that is not a high fructose corn syrup, um, shouldn't be confused with that um, whole uh, process that's used uh, beyond the corn syrups we use in our home baking. Honey and molasses, marshmallow cream, sorghum, sucrose, and that would include granulated brown and confectioner sugars. And then the new kit on the block here is stevia. So um, sugar and stevia is blended by CNH and Domino in their product called Sugar Light, which um, we'll co go to in a second and talk a little more about the benefits that brings and some of the substitution um, points. Sweetness in life, I mentioned the 2,000 years, but remember that consumer palates sometimes don't accept home-baked because home-baked will be less sweet than commercially baked at times. And um, that's sometimes true because what we have going on is an accustomed palate to very sweet beverages. So the non-natural sweeteners that are used um, to sweeten beverages can be 1,200 times sweeter than natural sugar. So when we flip back to products that we make at home, which may use less sugar in the first place, and then they aren't as intensely sweet as what people might be used to consuming, um, sometimes you have to back away, uh, become more accustomed to what you're doing at home. Fresh baked, however, has the edge because it can be not as sweet and use less total sugars and still get more flavor because of the freshness. It's, it's not had to stand up to shipping and packaging. So um, our commercial bakers have a challenge. Um, and again, uh, many of their products will advertise their like home baked, but they may have to alter their um, their formulations just because they want to deliver it to you as nice as it can be delivered in a package. We have to apply portion sense, and this I mentioned earlier. Again, I just can't emphasize it enough. Sometimes we think we cannot have um, some of the sweets we have, but one of the biggest issues we have is we just don't know how to cut the cake. We cut it in 
16 pieces when it should be cut in 24. Or um, we make other mistakes with our muffins. But at home, we don't have to do that. So 20 years ago, a muffin was an ounce and a half. Today, many muffins will be as much as four ounces. So we more than doubled the calories. For you educators, you should go to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute um, after our presentation and check out their PowerPoint. You can use it in your classroom. It shows the comparative changes in portion sizes. Um, decrease your amount that you use as well. Consider a drizzle, like this Caro syrup, slow fat spice cake. They just drizzle the, the, the frosting on, and it's perfect. It's more than enough. Maybe you want to just sift powdered sugar over your chocolate waffle or your um, your cake and or bar instead of icing it. And that might also give you just the amount of sweetness you need. Corn syrups and can also work well in a sugar glaze that allows you fluidity and glaze. Um, that's really attractive as well. When you think about comparative sweetness for calories, we come out really very close on it. Gave syrup, honey, and cane sugar, uh, tablespoon for tablespoon, sweetness for sweetness. Sugar and sweetener substitutions, then, many of us are trying to find a way maybe to um, work with a diabetic um, client. Uh, or maybe we ourselves just say, I don't want to give up my latte or my soda pop. Um, that sugar is important in my life, so where am I else can I cut my sugar? Um, again, what you might want to do is first start with portion sizes. Secondly, um, how um, frequently do you consume? any of the above that we've mentioned. And then you think about how much sweeter is agave nectar. If I used it, I might use 2 thirds cup of it when I was going to need a cup of sugar. When you do that, you want to reduce your liquids to um, a quarter to 1 third cup in the total batter um, for every 2 thirds cup of agave nectar you use. So um, you, you may need to do that just so that you can um, see the benefit of the agave nectar sweetness um, in comparison to sugar amounts. Honey, um, and by the way, you have a great guide for all of that on the CNA, CNH Sugar and the Domino Sugar website. They um, have it in spades on agave nectar use. Their test kitchens have worked hard on that. Um, honey um, is basically 125% sweeter than sugar. So if you use honey, um, you again could use slightly less. And then um, if you don't have honey on, in, your, in your pantry, then maybe you're going to need to substitute. And two cups powdered sugar plus one fourth cup liquid will suffice to substitute for a cup of honey as needed. Again, whenever you liquefy the sweetener you're using in your baking, you have to adjust your liquids. And then sometimes the acidity changes. Honey is one example of that. The Honey Board recommends that you use a half a teaspoon of baking soda for every cup of honey you use in your baking. Um, molasses and sorghum one, uh, offer you wonderful flavors. And um, I love to know this substitution. Sometimes I'm out of brown sugar when I'm baking. And you can take a cup of granulated sugar and simply cream in two tablespoons of molasses or sorghum. And in a pinch, I've used dark corn syrup as well. And you'll end up with a cup of packed brown sugar. It works well. Um, so feel free to, to do that in a pinch when you just don't have quite enough brown sugar on hand. Corn syrup, dark or light, um, of course, is comprised of fructose and sucrose. It is not a high fructose corn syrup. And we recommend that you go to a site like Caro Syrup, where they will give you really good specific recipes that have been developed by their chess kitchens um, for baking. Um, but again, that corn syrup will give great attributes to your products of, of humectancy, but also um, chewiness to, your, to some of your cookies or other products you're interested in baking. Sugar and stevia light, because you can use half the amount of sugar you would have called for in a, in a recipe, you automatically reduce your caloric content. Um, and then the stevia, of course, what it, this, the sugar gives you the granulated um, function. The stevia gives you the extra boost of sweetness that you need to make it work to cut your sugar in half. Your package gives you great, great directions. You can see a picture of it there up above. And then um, also the websites, CNH and Domino, have again used their test kitchen knowledge to help develop great recipes. Here is an example of a non-baked product where you substitute in and out different sweeteners, but you end up with basically the same amount of sugar per serving. So on the one on the left, um, it's an awful lot of type on one slide, I apologize, but we used a solo marshmallow cream. 
and it gave a really light fruit dip. Um, and we didn't. We we went ahead and used the Neuchatel light cream cheese. We used some Greek yogurt um, along with it, and um, we came up with this lovely light uh, citrus fruit dip, which is ideal for right now as the strawberries start coming in. But again, it was just 1.7 teaspoon sugar per dip serving. We went ahead and then switched over and tried a light agave nectar um, as our sweetener. You see, we only used a third of a cup for that and with a little vanilla extract and cinnamon. And again, we came up with 1.3 teaspoons sugar per dip serving. So um, again, it's, it's a matter of realizing that two tablespoons is enough dip as well. Cookie traits, um, crispness, I just want to run through these because sugar and fat, the two uh, functions we've just covered, are really important for how your cookies turn out. And cookies, of course, are one of our favorite things to bake in the US. Um, the stiffness of the dough and, um, will make a difference, and less moisture will make a difference in how crisp the cookie is. So a very crisp cookie is typically low moisture. It has high fat and high sugar in the recipe. It will ha have to, of course, bake long enough for the caramelization and gelatination to occur, and then moisture to any moisture in the butter, for example, to evaporate. Um, a small size or a thin shape, like a pizzelli, would be um, an example of a thin shape that's very crisp. Um, store these cookies to prevent them from absorbing moisture. So um, I'm just going to give you my tip, which is I like to bake a whole batch of cookies, but then I like to freeze immediately after cooling um, about two-thirds of those cookies or more. Sometimes I will, I will freeze almost the whole batch. That gives me, after I've eaten the warm ones, of course, but that gives me a chance to keep them fresh without the chance of them absorbing more moisture. Um, my other tip is give away half of your cookies. Always give away at least half of a recipe. You'll make lots of good friends, and um, you will need more than you need. Cookie traits for softness, um, this is important again. Um, usually there's more moisture in the mix, so that gives you some opportunity to put in more fruit, purees, pumpkin, grated carrot, zucchini, anything you wish to put into a, an oatmeal cookie, for example. Um, you'll use lower fat and sugar automatically. Um, soft sugar cookies are one that just go back. That was the popular cookie of the day back um, when my grandmother was around. And part of that was because they, use, they could use less sugar and less fat because of costs and because of the war. And so we might go back to some of those wartime recipes and say maybe they had it all together there. Um, sweeteners that will give you that softness and chew to are agave nectar, honey, uh, corn syrup, molasses. Sometimes we underbake them to get that attribute, and I want to just caution you on that. You want to be sure your cookies are done. You don't want raw dough in the middle. But um, you do just bake them to doneness, and they will bake another minute on the cookie sheet um, after you take them out of the oven. So keep that in mind. You don't want to overbake them either. I want to draw your attention to, on our website, homebaking.org, we have a section in our educator resources called Kitchen Science. Um, and Cookie Science is a lesson in that, uh, an abbreviated version of, in that, and then our baker's lab also has, lab manual also has um, multiple Cookie Science um, pieces to it. Chewiness, um, similar to um, softness, but again, you, have a, you will have a higher sugar and liquid content, a lower fat content. So if you can live without the crisp cookies, you will automatically typically have a lower fat content. Um, sometimes you can get that chewiness with a higher proportion of eggs. Or egg, um, and then don't, don't confuse egg whites with egg yolks. The yolk is the fat portion. The white is the protein portion. And the whites will, will give you lots of structure, but sometimes they will toughen things because of that um, pure protein that they are. More mixing to develop the gluten or a stronger, higher protein flour will also change the, um, the outcome, the chewiness of that product. If you're having too much spread, you might consider this. Um, you will decrease your spread by using the super fine sugars that are available in some, in some uh, baking aisles. You also, if you blend the fat and sugar to less of a, more of a paste and not so much of an aerated mixture, your spread will decrease slightly. Um, Half shortening and half butter are a great way to see that cookie bake and set on, uh, in it's the shape you want. And I put cold after butter to remind you, you do not want to over soften your butter. Um, and never use a butter 
substitute uh, low, you know, reduced fat butter in a product unless the recipe's been written for it, um, you will automatically add too much water. That cold butter is important. If you can take the stick of butter and just slightly bend it, that's, that's warm enough. And if you're using a mixer, you don't really have to soften that butter at all. Just put it in the mixer, turn on the, turn on the beater uh, attachment, and you will see the butter soften just fine momentarily. Be sure you preheat your oven. That control spread as well. You, if you put a, a pan of uh, cookies in the oven that's not fully preheated, they will either get dark on the bottom or they will spread too much before they can set. Um, the other thing is, of course, cool your baking pans before you put the next batch on it. Parchment liners will also help you control that spread. Now, browning sometimes is something we see change with the change of uh, ingredient substitutions. If we decrease sugar, sometimes we'll see less browning than we want. So you might consider putting some dry milk in the mixture. That will also increase the um, browning. Uh, if you change a sweetener to a honey or an agave nectar, you might see it go up. So you may need to um, decrease the, the baking time. You may need to decrease the oven temperature. You may need to tempt the product before the last 15 minutes. So these are three options that all will help. Where stevia and sugar blend is con concerned, you want to be sure you follow the package directions. And remember that there might be another ingredient. If your browning isn't where you want it to be, then you may want to turn around and use milk or honey for some small portion of that, um, the ingredients, one of the ingredients that will help with browning. Reducing salt in baking is a goal for many people um, this day and age. We want to see our sodium reduced. And at home, we can do some things that it's harder to do on the commercial level. Um, you, we typically use table salt, and that is fine. If you're using a kosher salt, you actually, for the same amount of sodium, need to use um, perhaps more because of the granulation size. So salt does matter. It adds flavor, but it also has um, a function. One of them is to control yeast. If you use too little, uh, your yeast action may um, move faster. One thing you can do is use colder liquids to try to slow that yeast action down. If you really must uh, reduce your yeast more than, or your salt more than you um, typically should um, for good functionality, and then it strengthens the gluten structure of the baked goods. So you want to be sure you um, use enough salt so that it strengthens that gluten structure, or you will get a real crumbly kind of. Um, crumbly structure to your bread. Too little makes the texture dense and heavy. Flavor will be flat or yeasty, so if there is that flavor component. You should not be using potassium chlorides in baked goods if they are standalone potassium chloride. It just doesn't function well. It doesn't have the same function, nor do the flavors work frequently. So um, it's better to try to look at where all the sodium sources are in the bread or the yeast, or the, uh, not the yeast product, but the um, baked good. Daily sodium and potassium targets. Take a note of that potassium level. We know our sodium target, but do you know your potassium level? Because that's where these substitutions can help. If we're using more whole grains, if we're using more um, fruits and vegetables in our baking, we will boost our potassium. Nuts are another one. Oh, yeah, all of these will really help our potassium levels. Ready to eat, of course, is one of our biggest problems with um, too much sodium. Um, they are working on it, too. It's a high target um, piece of the puzzle, but it, in uh, delivering food that's ready to eat and processed, it's a, it's a big challenge. Look at these two comparisons, though. When you do it yourself, the home prepared is on the right side. And um, I picked a favorite of our family, chocolate instant pudding, quick to do. When I grab the box and I put the milk in, I get 270 milligrams per serving. If I take time and cook it myself, and one of my favorite new recipes is this Cabot chocolate Greek-style yogurt pudding. When I prepared that recipe, I immediately um, cut my sodium in more than half. And that can be done across the board, whether this is the recipe you use or another one. Refrigerated biscuits um, in the can, 360 milligrams. I tried to get really close on the serving size there. Um, 360 milligrams per biscuit. And for your homemade Clabber Girl baking powder biscuit, you're going to end up with 90 milligrams. Um, and again, you're using a full tablespoon of baking powder. But the salt can be controlled, whether or not you use unsalted butter 
in that biscuit, whatever you choose to do, you can control that slightly. Baker's Choice Brownie Mix, um, it, brownies are, are sometimes so much better than people give them credit for um, in terms of just the, the values they have in them. But the sodium is still going to be higher in the box mix. So keep that in mind if you want to do a little scratch baking yourself. Um, Betty Crocker's all-time favorite brownie scratch recipe will give you somewhere between 14 and 70, 70 milligrams per brownie based on how you cut the brownie. One slice whole grain bread commercially baked is going to run around 170 milligrams or more. And then your whole grain breads at home, you can, you can bring them down to 75 milligrams to 140. So to sum up in reducing sodium, fresh home preps help, smaller portions, use some herbs, choose unsalted butter. Um, you immediately save 90 milligrams of sodium per tablespoon of butter in the recipe. So it's a great quick move. Um, Greek style yogurt. Again, we mentioned that. Again, you'll save uh, sodium. The light cheddars, um, like Cabot's, is less in sodium than many of the full fat um, cheddar cheeses or other cheeses. You've got to read the label. Check it out. You can always cut your salt, hopefully by a fourth of a teaspoon in many things, especially if you've added cheeses, seasonings, or olives. I mean, these are all um, salty ingredients. Even milk brings sodium into a mix. Always try a yeasted waffle or a pancake. I mean, honestly, we, we always think of these as chemically leavened, but the yeasted versions are oftentimes less in sodium because you can control the salt. And you really only need a half a teaspoon per four cups of flour, uh, excuse me, a teaspoon of salt per four cups of flour per package of yeast. Um, sometimes you can cut that back even more if it's something that um, doesn't, you're not going to need it, it doesn't have to have a long fermentation. It will just rise more quickly. Again, chemical leavenings do provide sodium. So in the, in the muffin you're going to see coming up, you're going to notice that I didn't put any salt in, and yet I had plenty of sodium. So, and that was because of the leaveners. I want to take a generous minute or two to talk about wheat flours. First of all, it is the structure of our baking. So you want to think about what structure you want. If you want um, a stretchy, strong dough, like for yeast breads or even for quick breads that are um, packed with fruits and vegetables and nuts and dried fruit like raisins, if you want a strong structure, you need a hard wheat. And that will be either all-purpose or bread flour. Your softer wheats will make a lower protein flour that's like a cake flour or a pastry flour. And that will give you the tenderness you're looking for in those products. All-purpose is a blend of both. Self-rising is an all-purpose flour, but it has the leavening in it. Um, several resources are good for you. North American Millers has some wonderful resources about how flour is made and cornmeal. And then um, wheatfoods.org offers some great resources, too. Whole wheat flour substitution, then. Any recipe, you have to remember, if you, what you want is whole wheat. If it's enriched, bleached, all-purpose, it's not a whole wheat. It has great attributes, but it's not whole wheat. And if it's, um, if it's degerminated bran, germ, or pearl, those terms all mean that it's also not whole grain. Um, it's still often enriched. Um, so that, that is a good, good thing to note. Any recipe can be half whole wheat flour. Let me just say that one more time. Any recipe you have should be able to be made with half whole wheat flour. So if it calls for a cup and a half of flour, all purpose, you use 3 fourths cup whole wheat and 3 fourths cup all-purpose, you should be coming out OK if you're using good measuring methods. And you see that little boy measuring in the upper right-hand corner there. He's stirring the flour, fluffing it up, spooning it into the cup, and he uses a knife to level it off, um, a flat edge of some sort. And so don't cut your corners, or you should weigh your flour for, for really good accuracy. Whole grain on any label, and in home baking as well, means that you need to have 8 grams of whole grain ingredient per serving. That could be cornmeal, it could be oatmeal, it could be wheat, whole wheat flour. Any of those will give you whole grain goodness. So if you want to go more than half whole wheat flour, remember, just try it. And what you might do, if, if the acceptance of the coloring, for example, is too dark for the, the um, we eat with our eyes people in your life, um, try a white whole wheat flour. And you'll see multiple options for that on the, on the baking aisle now. But what it means is it's a white wheat 
the, the brand coat is white instead of red, or at least it's kind of a golden color, and it's, it, it will give you a lighter colored product. It hasn't been bleached. It's just white. Cocoa or chocolate will help you mask coloring. So can spices and veggies and other things brighten up the color or the flavors in a whole wheat product. And I find that yogurt, sour creams, milk, sour milks, uh, buttermilk, all of those will help lighten up my quick breads. Um, so I frequently will try to use those as well, especially when they're 100% whole wheat. Um, you do not need more yeast in a whole wheat yeast bread. Sometimes you can get too much yeast that way. So go to our, our um, baking websites that, that offer yeast research. Like um, You'll see them in our membership section. It's important for you to note that um, right now there's a, there's a whole trend that says wheat is what our issue is with obesity. It's important to look at the data. Um, we can offer you lots of that in spades through um, many of our members as well as the Wheat Foods Council. But just note that um, in the year 2000, from the year 2000 to the year 2012, we have consumed almost 12 pounds less per capita of wheat flour. So that means, I mean, our obesity is there, our overweight is there, but it isn't wheat flour that's necessarily the culprit. In terms of ingredient allergies, um, I want to quickly go through this um, to note that um, you should always get it diagnosed because if you don't have that as your issue, it will make life easier for you and less expensive. Celiac disease is a disease, it is not an allergy, and it requires a blood test and an intestinal biopsy to determine it. And therefore, you want to encourage your clients to get that, not just to come in and say, oh, my doctor suggested I go gluten-free. Because what that will do, it adds stress to their life, lots of extra costs, and often less nutritional value. So um, the good news is that really um, only about 2% of our population, maybe up to 5% of our children, have these allergies to ingredients. And gluten um, hovers around 1% for celiac disease. And then non-celiac disease gluten sensitivity is estimated between 1% and 6%. Follow the research. Use good, solid research when you're working with those issues. Egg baking functions, I'm going to skim through this and cut to what we can do to substitute for eggs. But just note that they do leaven, they do give structure, and they certainly give nutrition. If you need an egg substitute, you can substitute for one to two eggs and quick breads, cookies, muffins, bars, pancakes. And there's three options that we use. Two egg whites and a half teaspoon oil will work. It will be tougher, though. Um, as a product. You can use three tablespoons of water and a tablespoon of flax meal for every egg, large egg. And you can use a fourth of a cup of soft silken tofu. Cream well. Cream your butter and your, um, and your sugar well. Then add your um, egg substitute and cream some more so you get plenty of aeration. Dairy substitutes include soy, rice, almond milks. You should always compare them nutritionally um, with dairy milk. And then um, just one for one. Cream cheese, um, again, you can use a tofu-based um, cream cheese substitute. And that um, is 12 ounces of silk and tofu, 2 tablespoons of vegetable oil, and a teaspoon of lemon juice, and a pinch of salt. If you need to bake with non-wheat flours, um, remember that the substitutions go like this. First of all, if you don't want to change the recipe at all, you just want more variety of grains in your product, you can take Anywhere, if you have a cup of flour, you can use a, up to a fourth of a cup of that um, cup of flour as any blend of non-wheat ingredient. And you shouldn't have to change your recipe. I will say that if you use rye or barley flour, you'll still get some gluten, which can help you with your structure. If you have a wheat allergy and you just have to get rid of the wheat, then you need to use a blend, just partly for texture and flavor, partly for functionality. None of those non-wheat flours except rye and barley will give you any gluten. So you have to realize you need to use some guar gum or xanthan gum, at least a half a teaspoon per cup of flour to give you structure. Gluten-free is typically the same thing, although they are not the same. Remember, wheat, barley, and rye are not gluten-free, and sometimes oats aren't either. But again, the guidelines are on our website under the glossary, gluten-free. And then we have multiple members that you should click on. They will offer you things like Land Lakes does here, gluten-free flour blends, or Argo Cornstarch has some great gluten-free waffles. 
our yeast companies, um, test kitchens have come up with good gluten-free guides. Bob's Red Mill has done much work as well as Hudson Mill and King Arthur Flowers. Let me just show you my, my trial, and then we'll be done here today. I took a great recipe to start with. It was, it was tested in the Kansas Wheat Commission's test kitchen. Um, it's a whole white wheat muffin. But I decided the things I would change about it, um, and they turned out pretty well. I took away part of the butter. You see I went with a third of a cup, and instead I used some golden flax meal for part of the oil or fat. I then used half the, or even less than half the sugar um, by using sugar and stevia light, and I threw in a tablespoon of molasses for a little extra color, a little extra richness. And then um, I, I decided I wanted it to be multigrain, so I, it calls for two cups of flour. So I took away a half a cup of the whole white wheat flour, and I used a whole cornmeal. I used some bar, brown rice flour and called it good. And then I used my soda and cinnamon. I used a half a cup of raisins. And from there, I used for my liquid um, grated carrot, milk, and Greek-style yogurt. And this is what my product looked like. It has a nice um, kind of a crunchy chew from the cornmeal, great color. I would have added more raisins and probably some nuts, just for taste. But the carrot, with all of the moistness was sufficient in my first trial. I want to say to remind you to you keep on top of your baking temperatures. We have great guide cards that offer you guidance. There's also information on our website. But you want to be sure your raw eggs um, are cooked completely, and you want to be sure the internal um, structure of the breads are set. So you need somewhere between 140 degrees for quick breads and 160. And then with yeast breads, you clear up to 190 degrees for gelatinization. Cool those products properly. Wrap them after they're cooled. And when you, you should freeze them and not refrigerate them, if possible, um, unless they're, they're sweet, you know, like cheesecakes. Offers you nonprofit information. Online order forms. And because we're nonprofit, we're very affordable. We have 30 member test kitchens. We have farmed kitchen resources. And we want to award you money for your work. So check us out. Now I want to thank you. And now let's look at questions. There's surely a few minutes for them. So let me take a look and see what we're, we're adding up. First of all, I have a question that says, should you remove two tablespoons out of the cup before, excuse me, I don't see the question completely here, before adding the two tablespoons butter or margarine when substituting skim milk for whole milk? Um, yes, put the two tablespoons butter in and then add the milk, skim milk. That's, that's a good point. Where do you find flax meal? You should be able to find it in your baking aisle or your cereal aisle. Either one of those is, is where you will find it. And, and go with flax meal, not the whole flax seeds. What was the website that showed portion history? It's the, Nas the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And we will post, um, we will post that um, as well uh, in, the, in the online uh, PDF of this, this PowerPoint. I'm glad to hear this is helpful. Thank you very much. Um, are there more questions? If there are no more questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, I just want to move on one slide to remind you to do the post survey, receive our free resources, and um, and also, you'll see the website um, will carry the recorded webinar. Now, here is my email. I invite you to ask questions if you wish to. And I, will, I see I have a couple minutes, so I'm going to go back to questions and answers. One question I have is, parchment paper is too expensive to suggest when working with poor families. Substitution. The substitution is what we have done forever, which is simply um, if you unwrapped um, a stick of margarine or butter, you rub that over the cookie sheet. Um, you take um, a, a, your hand or a, your clean hand, or you take a paper towel or napkin, and you put a little vegetable oil on it, and you rub that on the pan. So greasing still works. Parchment paper is something that we find to be, I and mean, I still consider it kind of a cool luxury, because um, I didn't grow up with it either. We didn't afford it. So. Um, but it does have great attributes in terms of saving um, your pans from getting gummy. Pan sprays are also a luxury, truthfully, and they aren't always so great for your pans. It, um, baking temperatures may make the pan get gummy from the pan sprays. So really, a little oil or shortening or, or butter greasing the pan is adequate. Any more questions? 
I can't thank you enough for, for coming online today. I hope you'll look for um, the resources we mentioned. I flew by the gluten-free um, and the, the baking substitutions for flours, but on our website is a great lesson called Baking for Special Needs. And I encourage you to go online uh, and look for that lesson. It has much of the material and information that I covered in that slide. Um, our baking lab manual has even more, so you may want to obtain a copy just to have as a resource to work with your clients. Um, it gives you so many great guides in it. Thank you very much. OK, everyone, this is Alexandra again calling from Cabot. I just wanted to come back on the line and say thank you very much for attending this evening and this afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, we do see a few more questions coming in, but we're just about uh, out of time here. So what we're going to do is we're going to post uh, a list of questions and answers for you, along with the recorded webinar and a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Those will be available on both Cabot's website and Home Baking Association's website. Um, and we'll shoot you an email in the next um, week or so to let you know where exactly you can find those resources. Uh, more importantly, too, we will be sending you out a post-webinar email by the end of the week, which will contain a survey, which we'd love your feedback on. Um, we just would like to know if we met your expectations, what we can do better, um, and what you'd like to see next time. Uh, also, anybody who fills out a survey will actually receive a free uh, baking resource packet from us. So please do take a minute and fill that out. And I guess I will close up now. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for presenting, Sharon. Wonderful job. <laughs>